Hi, my name is Evan Anderson, and I will be talking today um, about leveling up your GitHub repo config game. Um, this is something that's near and dear to my heart as a maintainer of Knative because I've needed to do this multiple times over the last several years. And so hopefully you will learn something in this about how to manage your own GitHub configurations. So I am Evan Anderson, um, as I've already, I already mentioned. I'm a software engineer at Stacklock. Um, previously, I was at VMware, and before that, I was at Google. I was one of the founding members of the Knative project and worked on the technical oversight committee for a number of years. I'm currently a steering committee member, and I'm also on call for Source public good instance. So I've got a little experience with a couple different ways of doing these things. Um, if you've got other experiences, I'd love to hear from um, to hear from you about them. You can find me on the CNCF Slack is probably the easiest way to find me and feel free to drop me a note. Um, so first of all, um, there's a lot of stuff you could worry about. Why are you worried about repo configuration? Um, well, one reason is that we've got a lot of these things. You know, the CNCF probably, I would guess is 20,000 repos or more. Um, in the various projects. You can see that individual projects sometimes have 50 to 100. You'll see Knative extensions is down there. The core Knative repos have another 36. So Knative is pushing close to 100 repos right now. And that's a lot to keep track of. Um, and it doesn't, it feels like just an extra thing, but it's a really important thing because if you screw up your repo configuration, um, there's a lot of bad stuff that can happen. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Salsa model of supply chain security. Um, Salsa basically came and categorized all the different ways that people could get into open source and commercial supply chains um, in order to get people running software, including people running those CNCF projects software. So if you're running Argo or Kubernetes or Envoy or anything like that, attackers could come in and you know, try to submit some unauthorized changes, you know, bypass pull request reviews and things like that. Compromise where the source con source code is stored. Now, since we're mostly storing source code on GitHub, um, that's mostly GitHub's problem. Um, yay for vendors. But uh, if you run your own Git repos, the Linux kernel, for example, um, about 15 years ago or so had some host compromised and that could have compromised a Git repo, it didn't in this case. But it was one of those near misses, and I think there was an Ars Technical story about it a few months ago that had some new information that we discovered 15 years later. So um, these can be slow, deep attacks. You know, if you saw the XZ attack, um, it took two years to build up the trust to be able to start submitting unauthorized changes and building from modified sources. Um, so those are some of the attacks that we're worried about in this particular talk. Um, Beyond that, you know, there's a bunch of threats. Um, you can have a CVE in your dependencies. Your build process could get compromised. We'll talk a little bit about build processes because a lot of you are using GitHub Actions and those are driven through configuration that's in your source control system. So that's another place where your source control system can get back in and can affect your supply chain security. Um, and then there's a bunch of attacks that can happen later on where someone goes and replaces the thing that you uploaded that was good and safe with a bad thing and people go and consume the bad thing not knowing it's from you. And this is where tools like SigStore can help you recognize that, hey, I'm using a bad package. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that we put in these repos. Like this is the this is the heart and soul of your project, of your open source project, or the heart and soul of your software really is your source code. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of stuff that you need. You may need license files. You may need to check licenses. Uh, you may need, you know, code to conduct and security files and PR reviewers. Um, you may have your CI configuration in there. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you may need to manage. Um, and when you've got 100 repos, you got to do that 100 times and you got to do it right each time, um, which kind of sucks. Um, I've, as you can see, We've been here with Knative, um, both on the, hey, we made a spreadsheet to collect a bunch of information because we couldn't get it out any other good way, and uh, writing little bash scripts that go and 
list all the repos in the Knative org and check them all out and put a consistent code of conduct in there. And like, I'll write these bash one liners and then I'll forget like how I did it. And then like three or six months later, we'll be like, oh wait, now like we need to adjust this a little bit. And again, you have to go and build all this stuff. Um, and it's unique to code of conduct or it's unique to license. And you have a whole bunch of little just bespoke garbage. Um, it's not fun. So let's talk about some of the tools that we might be leveraging in those repos first. So GitHub has a bunch of security tools that you get for free when you're an open source repo. Um, branch protections are the simple and obvious ones. Don't let people commit to main without a you know code review. Don't let people force push to main and overwrite history. Um, you can also, um, there's a secret scanning feature that GitHub rolled out in the last year or so that will flag when you accidentally go to check in an SSH key or an AWS token or something like that um, and can actually keep people from even pushing those changes at all or flag them in a PR and say, hey, now you can't submit. Um, Dependabot, uh, many of you are probably familiar with, comes along and tells you, hey, you're using a, vulner you're using a dependency that has a vulnerability. You should upgrade. Here's a PR. Um, so that's super handy in terms of keeping you um, safe and up to date on the dependency front. And then um, they have a tool called CodeQL um, that lets you actually go in and do some static analysis and say, hey, you know, when do we, um, you know, call a function and then don't catch an exception or don't check the error in Go or something like that? Because um, that could be an error where it's like, oh, hey, I went to check authorization. I got, uh, you know, is this user, you know, prohibited? Um, no, comma, error couldn't reach database. And so then you might be like, oh, well, this user is not on a block list. Let him through when actually you couldn't reach your block list. Um, so that helps you avoid actual security bugs later. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, some of the security tools for making sure that what you publish actually is what people consume. And so GitHub has this feature called Artifact Attestations that leverages some great open source work um, in SigStore and the Salsa model that we met, referenced earlier um, so that you can actually sign the artifacts you produce and everyone can check and see that, yes, this is what Evan meant to publish for Knative or what your build automation meant to publish for Knative. And, you know, it wasn't a random rogue build on somebody's desktop, you know. Even if they're a maintainer, you'd want to be like, I don't trust that maintainer because they have automation. Why should a maintainer ever be publishing something? Um, and then lastly, um, a tool to sort of measure where you are is the OpenSSF scorecard. So this is a free service run by the OpenSSF and they um, will basically check that you're following a bunch of different best practices and give you a score based on what they observe about your repo. Now, the really nice thing is this is automated and they run it automatically for the top 50,000 open source projects or something like that. Or you can add it to your CI, to get it automatically run whenever, you know, on a schedule or something like that. And in either case, it'll check a bunch of stuff that other people can observe. So people know this anyway, but this is giving you like a nice score where you can be like, hey, why are we a 5.5? We should really be a 7. What can we do, you know, to turn on some of this stuff to make sure that this is actually, um, we're doing the right things to secure that software that thousands of other people are depending on that we don't know, even know who they are. If we wanted to tell them there was a big oopsie, we don't have their names. So let's talk about some of those tooling options now that we've explained why you'd care about the tooling and, you know, what some of the base atoms for managing some of this are. Um, so Knative uh, loves automation. And some of this is stuff that we built ourselves because we couldn't find other tools. And so basically you can roll your own. And we have a repo where we have a bunch of actions that iterate over all of our other repos and using a account called Knative Automation, who's got that little sock puppet icon up there, will go and send PRs to do various fix-ups. We basically built our own version of Dependabot for things like copying over owner's aliases files. Um, next, um, you can use something like Terraform or Pulumi. I know that SigStore uses Pulumi, for example, um, in order to uh, provision all of this stuff and configure it. So you can see in this case, we're declaring GitHub repository and we're setting some branch protections and um, setting the 
default branch name to master because this was probably written a few years ago. Main is a better choice. Um, I'm recording this on Juneteenth, so that seems particularly appropriate. Um, another tool um, that I'm a little biased to because it's my employer and I've been working on it um, is a tool called Minder, and it's free for open source repos. Um, and it aims to uh, put help you put guardrails on what you're doing. So if we go back and look at the Terraform example, this is saying, I want this GitHub repository and I want these things. And if you don't declare something, it's just, eh, whatever. Um, Minder aims to be in the opposite thing where uh, for the stuff that you care about, you spell that out and you say, I care about these things. And then the rest of it, we'll let you manage it with other tools like Pulumi and so forth. But if your Pulumi config or your Terraform config is setting something dangerous, we'll go and correct it. And then you'll have two machines fighting each other and hopefully we'll win. Um, All Star is somewhat similar. Um, my personal take is that it's a little bit more opinionated in exactly what things it's going to fix um, and a little bit less configurable. Um, sometimes you also have to run your own copy. So that can be a little bit of an extra overhead compared with a cloud service. Um, other than that, uh, it's another reasonable thing that's kind of in the same vein. Um, if you are already using Prow, you may or may not be familiar with Parabolus, which is another piece of infrastructure from the Kubernetes community. And Kubernetes uses this to manage all of the repos they have and a whole bunch of different projects and the memberships and so forth. Knative also uses it because we're also already on the Prow train. Um, and then Otterdog is a tool that the Eclipse Foundation has built. It, again, is kind of similar to Parabolus, but has some different takes on things and has a really nice dashboard that you'll notice a lot of these other tools don't tend to have dashboards. And so you're kind of just looking at it and you're like, oh, what do I do? So um, I've talked a bit about Knative. And um, so these are some of the tools that Knative is using to handle a bunch of different repo configuration concerns. So for CI, we use both GitHub Actions and Prow. Um, there's reasons, it's fine. Um, for repo configuration, we're using Parabolus. Um, it doesn't have its own icon. Sorry about that. Um, we do fuzzing of our software with OSS fuzz, and we use both CodeQL and GoVolnCheck um, when we are doing static analysis to flag things like that. Hey, you forgot to check the error um, status of that Go function. Um, lastly, we had to write a GitHub action um, to flag commits that include Unicode characters that might be suspicious. So. Um, there was a paper a few years back about how you can hide code by using things like right to left encoding to switch around the order of things that as they display. And GitHub will warn you about some of that stuff now, but we just want to straight out outlaw it. And so um, we will block PRs that have Unicode characters um, hiding things in them. So that's a lot of different tools. Do you need to use all of them? Definitely not. In fact, some of them you should not use together because they will hurt you. Um, so to start with, uh, the big decision is, are you looking for a declarative where you spell out everything that you want to have? Or are you looking for a guardrails approach where you say, I can have anything as long as, um, as, long as these conditions are met? And if you're looking for a declarative configuration, um, are you looking for some package software? Or are you looking for some software with full control? Um, and then we'll get into some of these other pieces later on. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is actually a thing where you have to decide what your philosophy is. Um, both of these are reasonable things. Um, so declarative configuration, sometimes also called configuration as code, means that you define your entire configuration. These are all the repos I want. These are all the people I want to be members of the repos. These are all the branch protection policies and so forth. Um, the nice thing is that then it's just a PR that anyone can do to propose creating a new repo. Um, the problem is that two tools that both think they own the whole world are going to butt heads. And so you can really only pick one of these declarative tools. Um, and you need to specify everything that you want to do there. If you don't talk about branch protection, it just won't do it. Um, whereas configuration guardrails is basically about safety limits. It says, hey, if you've got this, you need this other thing. or um, if this thing's going on, then you can't use this other feature. Um, 
And so that means that you can use your existing tools. You can use the GitHub UI if you want, or you can use one of the declarative tools and then use the guardrail as a backstop that says, oh, and we know we'll never hit this problem because we've blocked it out. The next decision you have to make is how much code do you want to write? Um, something like YAML is very verbose. You have to repeat yourself a whole bunch of times, but it's very simple to understand. It's basically a data structure. Whereas on the other hand, if you start looking at something like Terraform or OPA or JSON it, or all the way over on the right, I've got Bash because some of the Knative stuff uses Bash. Um, those are all complex things you have to reason about how they work. Um, and that can be a form of lock-in. You need to figure out how much customization do I want and how much additional automation do I want to add. And the more automation you want to be add or the more customization you want to be able to do, the more code you're going to need. And then the, la the last thing you really have to think about is where does this configuration live? Um, it can live in a central config file. So you can see a lot of these tools prefer that. Um, it gives you one place to understand all the configuration. It lets you potentially say things like repos with this label should have this policy. Production things should be this way. Experimental things don't have these constraints and so forth. That can be a big um, configuration and it's not right next to the repo. So you have to kind of figure out like you poke at something and it gets set back and you're like, why did that happen? You have to go poke around and figure out why. Um, on the other hand, looking in the repo and org structure, um, like your GitHub directories, is easy to find and it lines up with GitHub's patterns, but GitHub's patterns don't always line up with the real world. Like Knative has two GitHub orgs. We have Knative for the official APIs and then extensions for all the stuff that builds on those APIs but that aren't strictly required to get a Knative installation running. Um, also, uh, if someone can commit to that repo, then they can compromise the controls. And so security wise, you might or might not be comfortable with that. So um, this is just the slide. You know, if we were in person, I'd be like, hey, you can take a picture. It tells you, you know, what was the file philosophy and what is the code configuration for all these different tools. Um, and Minder actually supports both um, Rego and a JQ based query language. And with that, I'm going to demo um, how Minder works to you. Um, this is just a quick, like, here's one tool, and this is what I happen to use, so that's what I'm going to do. So we're just going to start here with a simple application that I've created on GitHub. Um, I've put no work onto security settings or anything like that, so if we get started, we'll see that the default behavior is to not even have any branch protection rules. Um, and I've just got a bunch of code that has a Docker file and, you know, a Python app and some other stuff like that. And we're going to go over to the Minder dashboard. And I have two profiles that I've already created. Um, one of them is sets up a variety of settings for branch protection. And the other one sets up a number of dependency security options. And so this will make sure you have Dependabot enabled and ch check um, your pull requests. And so we can, if we remove this one, um, this is a pre-canned profile. So you can apply this out of the box. Um, this demo profile is actually one that I've handwritten and I'll show you how that works a little later. And now if we go and turn on automatic remediation, for both of these. Let's go take a look at how that affects the repo. So first of all, we can go over to settings and you'll see that we now have these branch protection rules. If we go in, we're requiring pull request approvals and we don't let administers, uh, administrators bypass these. Um, and so Minder's watching this continuously. This is the guardrail setting that we were talking about. So if I go and just, I'm like, nah, I don't want branch protection rules. And I come back, Minder has noticed that they've disappeared and sets my branch protection rules back. Um, the other thing that's going on is um, we had those dependency rules. And so Minder has opened a PR that adds configuration to make sure that we're up to date with the PIP um, environment with the PIP ecosystem. Um, if we look back over here, um, 
this is the Minder profile that we define. This is the demo profile, and it makes sure that we have the various branch protection rules enabled. Um, this one actually has other stuff that you might want to enable as well, um, but I trimmed things down for the demo. And so um, if you're curious, you can also see we have several repos, and you can look and see, OK, which policies aren't applied yet. And you can see in this case, Dependabot isn't yet configured because we didn't approve that PR. So it's got some outstanding work to be done. Um, and that's basically minor in a nutshell. So um, that's one tool. Um, if you want to take a look, for example, at how Parabolus is set up for Knative, um, that's at uh, github.com knative community. And inside there, there's a repo called, or a directory called Parabolus. And then um, you can see that this is a lot of YAML configuration. Now, much of this is permissions configuration rather than branch protection configuration. So the branch protection configuration actually is in the prow setup, which is an entirely separate repo with even more declarative YAML code. Um, in fact, there's enough of this stuff that Knative um, actually has scripts to generate the YAML, but then um, we check in the YAML so that it's easy to review. What does this actually mean as opposed to having to think through those um, changes? Thanks for watching. If you're curious about Minder, um, it's available for free forever for public repos. Um, I've shown you the web UI. It's also an open source self-hosted platform, so you can run your own copy if you want. You'll need um, OpenFGA and Keycloak um, as two requirements, plus a Postgres database to support those, and um, probably a Kubernetes cluster and uh, various other configuration, a GitHub app for managing those actual interactions with GitHub. Um, but there are instructions for setting all that up and running it either for development because you're curious or, you know, an actual production usage. Um, and we have a Discord if you are curious or run into any of those problems. So thank you and keep those repos safe.